morning, this morning we are talking about prayer and rest. Prayer and rest. And we're looking specifically at the book of Mark and the things Jesus taught his disciples to do that are essential to our faith. And as I was preparing this message, I couldn't help but think of the show, Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? You remember that show? It's like 20 years old. I was a kid when it came out, and it was so cool, and we'd watch it on TV every night, and you know, you felt really smart if you knew a few of the answers, right? Yeah. But I, you know, I told my mom, my parents have been going through stuff in their house, and this is my phone from my room growing up. This is my cool blue phone. Cam asked me if it was on, and uh, I had to explain to him that's not how this works, but... <laughs> You don't understand the struggle. It was a struggle. It was corded. I could only go in my room. Anyways, but it made me think of on who wants to be a millionaire. You'd have these people come on this show, right? And you answer all these questions. If you can answer them right, you win a million dollars, which is pretty exciting. And there were three lifelines, 50-50, ask the audience, and phone a friend. And the phone a friend one always made me so anxious. It always, every time they would choose phone a friend, I don't know what it was. I think some of it was I was so worried that the person on the other end of the phone, the person they had selected was not going to answer. You know, like they, and their cell phones were not as big then 20 years ago. And so you would literally have to have been waiting by the phone in your house, waiting for that call. Some of you teenagers, you have no idea. Now I'm that person saying, you don't know how it was, right? But you would have to have been waiting in your house by the phone. Then I would get anxious because I'm like, what if they answer and they are like confident that they know the answer and it's wrong? And you cost them a million dollars because you thought that you knew and it was not the right answer. And every time when I would be watching that show, I would just have so much anxiety on the phone a friend lifeline. But I think so much of it is that in life, you know, we all want to have people who we know we could call them up and they'll tell us exactly what to do. They will always answer. But typically, it doesn't always happen like that, right? Like even, you know, my mom always answers her phone most of the time. You know what I mean? Like no person ever is going to answer you 100% of the time. No person is ever going to have the answers 100% of the time. But God always does. He always does. And when we look at the idea of prayer, I know, you know, for some of you, maybe for you, prayer is like this thing that, that you do once a week at church or, or it's you pray the Lord's Prayer or, you know, different things like that. And, and, but prayer is really our relationship with God. It is this conversation. It is the same as me picking up the phone and me calling my mom and saying, hey, what, what, what setting should I set my crock pot on for this? Because I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing. Hey, how often should I be watering my new grass that I planted? It is very much like that. It is very much like that. It's a relationship. But sometimes I think we treat God like he's our phone-a-friend lifeline. And we do not call him as often as we should. We don't pick up the phone and just listen. And this is the thing that, that I love about God when we talk about prayer, you know, God might not always give us the answer we want. If you're taking notes this morning, this is the first point. But he will always give us the answer we need. He will always give us the answer we need. Sometimes we might call him up asking about one thing, and he's like, no, don't even worry about that. This is the thing that I want you to be focusing on. He might not always give us the answer we want to hear, because he doesn't always give us the easy path, but he always gives us the right path forward. He always gives us the right things to do. And we don't just get one chance to call him and like, that's it. We get unlimited opportunities to be able to come to him and bring our needs to him, bring our requests to him. But we have to understand with prayer that it's so much more than just like about us. Prayer is way more than just about what we think or what we need. Prayer really is about us hearing from the Lord so that we can become more like him. In Mark chapter 1, we're going to backtrack to the first chapter But Jesus does something, very first thing, very first thing in the book of Mark, very first thing before he goes out and begins to do ministry. And this is what it says in Mark 1, 35 through 36. It says, very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. 
Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. And here's the thing as I read that. Jesus' first priority was to go connect with God. His first priority was not to get up in the morning and get out and preach. His first priority was to get up, to go and be by himself, to get himself in a place where he could really hear from the Lord. And Jesus knew that his mission was to preach. That's what he says clearly to the disciples. He says, I have come so I can preach. I have come so I can change your lives. But he knew he couldn't even attempt to preach until he prayed. And how often do we get up, and maybe you're like, I'm not preaching every day. Yes, you are. You are preaching to people with your life. You are preaching to people in your workplace. You are preaching to your family. You are preaching to people in the grocery store. As you are either proclaiming the goodness of God, or you are not. And so for us, do we understand that in the morning when we get up and throughout our day, our priority is not the work that God has for us to do. It's to be with him. It's to hear from him. It's to know and do the things that he has asked us to do. And prayer is what connects us with God. Just like, you know, this phone was connected to a cord. It's kind of how we have to view our lives. We want to be tethered to God. We want to be so connected to him. But we live in a very disconnected world. We live in a very disconnected world. There are more opportunities to be connected to people through social media, through all kinds of different things. But I think we are more isolated and disconnected than we've maybe ever been. We are more distracted than we've ever been. Everything feels louder than it's ever felt. And if we don't make prayer a priority, and true prayer, not just God help me, true prayer, spending time with him, listening to him. And in Matthew chapter 6, the disciples come to Jesus and they say, teach us how to pray. And notice they don't say, teach us a prayer. I think sometimes we wish we like knew all the exact words and phrases to say. Sometimes prayer feels really awkward. If you ever feel like that, you're like, I don't even know what to say right now. It can feel really uncomfortable. We can feel pressure that we have to know all the right things to say. But prayer is not about knowing the right things to say. It's about having the right heart. It's about having the right heart. God could care less if you know all the right things to say. He wants to see that your heart, that you're coming to him and you're saying, God, help me. Help me to know how to navigate my day today. Show me what you're asking me to do. God, help me with my family. Help me in my work. Help me. And as we begin to pray God's way, we learn how to align our hearts with his. And if you've been around church for every amount of time, you have probably heard or prayed this prayer that Jesus taught to his disciples. It is called the Lord's Prayer. And it's a powerful prayer. It's a powerful prayer. And it's a difficult prayer if you really acknowledge the things that you're praying. And this is what it tells us in Matthew 6. 9 through 13. This is what Jesus says. He says, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed meaning holy. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And if we break this down, Cole, walk with me through it as we break down the different parts of this. So if we look at the first part, our Father in heaven, prayer should shape our understanding of God. God is not just like out there somewhere. He's not, you know, he is our Father in heaven. Holy is your name. We come to him and we want to worship him. We want to worship him because of who he is, because of our understanding of who he is. Then prayer begins to shape our focus of God. So we begin to realize your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And recognize that this is what Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? As he is struggling. We talked about that, I think, a few months ago. He is struggling and he's bringing how he feels to the Lord. But what's the thing he keeps saying? But not what I want, but what you want. Because I'm not about building my kingdom or my stuff or my way. I'm about building your kingdom your purposes, your way. And so it begins to shape our focus. Then it begins to shape our trust in God. Give us today our daily bread. Think back to when the Israelites, God had brought them out of slavery in Egypt and they're wandering in the wilderness. How were they provided for every day? God would send manna from heaven. 
every single morning for them. But the one thing about the manna is it was only good for that day. If they tried to keep it, it would, it would grow nasty. It would have like maggots and all this different stuff in it. And even in that moment, God was trying to teach them, you've got to come back to me every day for fresh. You've got to come back to me every single day. Don't live off of what you got at church last Sunday. Come to me every day. I am so available to you every single day. Don't settle to live off of leftovers. Come to me. Let me fill you up and give you what you need on a daily basis. Then I think prayer really begins to shape our gratitude toward God as we go, man, forgive me as I have forgiven other people. God, forgive me. I I am the worst. I am a sinner. I don't deserve your mercy. And because I'm able to receive that, then I, I give that freely to everyone else in my life. We become so grateful for who God is and for what he's given to us. Then prayer really begins to shape our obedience toward God. I've never thought about this part of this verse in this way until recently. You know, it says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know, God is always going to be leading and directing you where to go, but you get to choose whether you follow him or not. And so when we're praying, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, we're really praying, God, show me where to go and give me the courage to be obedient to follow you. Give me the ability to do the things that you are asking me to do, that I would not cave to temptation, that I would not cave to evil, that I would not cave to sin, but that I would follow after you. And then finally, prayer, it really shapes our expectation of God. It shapes our expectation of him. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. God is in charge. He is in charge, and it is his kingdom, and we just get to live in it. And what a privilege and what an expectation that should give us for what he can do in our little worlds. If he is truly in charge, if it is his kingdom, that should fill you with such joy. It should fill you with such expectation as you come to him and you know that he wants to meet you and he wants to change your life. And God may not always change your circumstances. He may not always change the things that you are coming to him and asking for, but he will always change you. He will always change you. This is the next key point this morning. Prayer is much more about God shaping me than about me impacting him, than about me getting him to do the things that I'm wanting him to do. We still, he wants us to bring our requests to him. And how many of you, you know, there are times you've been praying and praying and praying and God comes through on the thing you're praying for. But there's some times where maybe that's not what he's wanting to do and we don't understand that. But can we allow ourselves to be changed and shaped in the process as we trust him, as we're grateful for him, as we know who he is and we have expectations for what he's wanting to do? And if we want to pray effective prayers, this is the model. This is the model for what it looks like. And we don't have to pray just all these specific words. That wasn't the point of what Jesus was trying to teach them. But he was giving them the model, this is how you pray. This is how you come to me. This is how you experience true life change. Because that's really what prayer is all about. Prayer is not about us getting what we want. It's about us becoming more like God. It's about us really embracing who he is and saying, God, teach me. God, show me. God, help me. Sometimes that's the biggest prayer I pray. I'm like, God, help me. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. But every time that I come to him and that's my heart and I can just humble myself and say, man, God, I don't know. He does. He is so faithful to reveal to me what it is that he wants me to know. He is. He is so faithful. And prayer is such an important part of our lives. We, we cannot, you know, even this morning, I'm like, all these different things were going wrong, and we've had a really crazy week, and I had to just step out to the side, and I'm like, I just have to pray. And I'm not praying just because I need God's help. I'm praying because when I get up here, I want to be and speak the things that God is wanting me to. And that is how Jesus wants us to live every day, not just in moments like this. But prayer, it wasn't the only thing that Jesus prioritized right off the bat. Notice he goes off and he prays, but he also goes off to be by himself. He goes off to get away. And later in Mark chapter 6, Jesus does this again. And and it says there were so many people coming to them when people were figuring out the things that Jesus could do. And they were so drawn to his teaching And so he says to them in verse 31, he says, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. 
come with me by yourselves to a quiet place. Let's get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But, and I'm going to abbreviate this part of it. We're not going to read all the verses. But it tells us that the people, they saw where they were going and they followed them. Maybe moms can relate to this. You're like, I just want to go take a shower by myself. And someone is knocking on the bathroom door needing you, right? And so they're trying to get away. They're trying to be able to rest. But the people followed them. And when Jesus saw them, he had compassion on them. And then we get the miracle of where they feed the 5,000 and, and, and they, Jesus provides for their needs. He literally gives them their daily bread, which is pretty cool. And then they were able to get away after that. And sometimes in life, we've got really good intentions of being able to rest. We've got good intentions of, you know, all these different things. And life just happens. And your day gets thrown off. Your vacation gets canceled. Your morning gets messed up. But after you have taken care of the things that were essential for you to take care of, and not everything is essential, but a lot of things are, can you come back and return to rest? Can you come back and keep trying to make that a priority in your life? And so Jesus, he took care of the work that God had placed in front of him to do. And then he sent the disciples away by boat. He was like, I'm going to meet you on the other side. And Jesus went off by himself to pray. And this was something Jesus would do consistently throughout the scriptures. He would go away by himself to just recharge. And I know I am an introvert. So for me, that's very important that I get, you know, even like 30 minutes a day of just being by myself, not looking at my phone, no one texting me, no one talking to me. That's something that for me, I really need. And Jesus, maybe he was an introvert too, because he kept going off by himself. But he sends the disciples in the boat, and what was meant to be a really peaceful, probably end to their evening, they've had a crazy day, they've just seen Jesus feed 5,000 people, and the disciples do not understand what is going on. They do not understand what has just happened. And so they're in the boat by themselves. Anybody like being out on the water, you know, and they're just like out floating on the water, hanging out, and all of a sudden, a storm comes. And this storm comes, and what was supposed to be this nice evening of rest is suddenly chaos and turmoil. But Jesus was not thrown off by this. He wasn't. He comes down from the mountainside, and he walks out to them on the water, and they were freaked out by that. And Jesus gets into the boat, and immediately everything was calm. Immediately everything died down, the winds, the waves, everything. And here's the thing I think we can maybe learn from that. Getting away to take a break by yourself is really good. It's good. But having Jesus in your boat is even better. Having Jesus in your boat is even better. Jesus is not just our lifeline. He is our lifeboat. And if he's in my boat, I know that I'm good. I know that no matter what is going on, that he is going to take care of it. And rest isn't just about getting away from the chaos. This is also in your notes. It's about allowing Jesus to calm the chaos. It's not just about getting away. Getting away is good. But if you never involve Jesus in your rest, I'm not saying you've got to pray all day long or anything like that. But if you're not involving Jesus, if he's not in your boat, it's going to continue to be chaos. But when Jesus is in the boat, it's calm. It's calm because that's who he is. He is the one who brings peace and strength and restoration in the midst of difficult surrounding circumstances. We were designed to need rest. I mean, physically, emotionally, spiritually, we need moments of stillness and quiet. You know, even athletes, as they're training, you have to have a day off a week so your body can recover. For us, emotionally, how many of you know when it's just emotionally so hard, man, it's draining. You get to these places where you feel so burnt out. And a lot of times when we're in these places, it's the perfect invitation for us to rest. And God doesn't come to us and shame us and be like, how dare you not take a day off for two months? I remember one time, I think I literally didn't have a day off for 60 days. Didn't have a full day off for 60 days. And some of that was my own choice. And some of it was I just felt pressure. This was before I was working for the church because as pastors, we, we, we should be Sabbathing, right? Because... We're telling you to do it. But when I was in college, man, I would just work nonstop. And I was in school, and it was terrible. And I was in such a bad place physically. I was in such a bad place emotionally. My, it was affecting my spiritual life. 
because I felt like I truly had no time. I mean, it was truly such an excruciating time. And in that moment, I really did. I felt like God spoke to me and he said, you need to take a day off and you need to just be with me. You need to just be with me. It's not just about you sleeping. It's about you being with me and allowing me to fill you back up. And this might be why God repeatedly throughout Scripture tells us to rest. It's what he does when he creates the world. What does it say? On the seventh day, he rested. And this will also be in your notes. God didn't do that because he needed to rest. He's God, right? We've just said he is so powerful. He's in control. He did not need to rest. But again, he's modeling for us that we need to rest. And if he is going to prioritize rest and take a day off, we probably should too. We probably should too because we are not God. We are human. We are finite. We are so small and incapable of doing all these things without his help. And when we take that time to rest, you know, in Exodus 20, it tells us, you know, this is one of the Ten Commandments, to remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you should labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea, but he rested on the seventh. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. God has made rest a holy thing. It's not just something we need. It is a holy thing. It's holy, and it's so awesome. You know, I've shared this before. When I was in college, I had the opportunity to go to Israel and study abroad for a few weeks. And on the Sabbath, can I tell you, it was one of the weirdest experiences of my life because the whole city literally shut down. We were in Jerusalem. It is a huge city. And the city just, I mean, you could noticeably tell the difference in volume. You did not see people going out. And I know in America, it's very hard for us to live like that. But how can we live more like that? where we have a day where we're like, this is our family day, or this is my day for myself. And we really do make it about doing things that are going to add joy to our life. Sabbath isn't just about like sitting around. Sometimes you need to just sit around. I know that's Josh's ideal day off, just sit around and do nothing. For me, I want to sit around some. I want to go on a walk. I want to be in nature. I want to maybe hang out with a friend or do something. Sabbath is about doing things that honor God that don't add more to you. They should be things that are life-giving, things that are fun, things that are bringing joy and that refreshing to your life. And then obviously that we spend time with God too. And we call him up and we pray and we read our Bible. Maybe you, you listen to a good podcast or something that is going to help you to think deeper about who he is. Sabbath is so important. It's almost like God designed us to be dependent on him. It's, it's almost like he designed us. He did not design us to be independent, to be just doing our own thing. And again, in America, I know that's really hard for us because we're very independent people. We're very independent culture, individualistic. But God designed us to depend on him. And he designed us to depend on each other too, that we have other people in our life who are helping us through life and encouraging us to keep going and serving him. But ultimately... Only God is the one who is going to be able to help you. You know, I think back to Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, and, and you know, he's, he's just like, he knows he's going to die. It's this terrible moment for him, and he's, he's struggling. And he brings the disciples with him, and they still don't get what's going on, right? And he's like, will you please pray? Stay up and pray with me. And they, like, just kept falling asleep, and they kept missing it, and they were not, they did not understand what was going on. And sometimes it's the same in our lives. We need good, godly people we can bounce things off of and people who are going to come with us in prayer for certain issues. But at the end of the day, nobody is going to meet our needs like God. Nobody can give us the wisdom and the strength that we need like God because he is God. He is God. And I know that sounds really simple, but no one in your life is going to be the better lifeline than God himself than the one who created you, the one who knows you, the one who loves you, the one who wants what's best for you. And so we have to rest, we have to pray, we have to seek him, because without these things, we can't possibly do the work he's asked us to do. We just can't. We can do our very best, but we will never be enough. We will never be able to do enough or work enough or achieve enough. But when we allow God to be the first priority in our life, he says we're enough, and he enables us to do more than we could ever ask or imagine. He enables us to do such incredible work. In 
for Josh and I, you know, when, when I first became a pastor, Josh was not a pastor. And so Monday was supposed to be my day off, but he was not at home, so he didn't know what I was doing. And I would just do chores all day. And to me, that was kind of fun. And I would just spend the whole day kind of working, and then we would hang out when he got home in the evening. And uh, when he became a pastor and we had our first Monday off, I, I got up and I started, you know, doing my thing. And he says, what are you doing? And I was like, it's Monday. And he says, you're right, it's Monday. We're supposed to be doing nothing. We're supposed to be resting. And it was really hard for me. It was very hard for me because I liked just being able to do what I wanted to do. But it's helped me so much to know that most weeks, it's not every week, but most weeks on Monday, that's just our day. And it is awesome. It is awesome. If you text or call me on a Monday, I'm probably not calling you back unless it's an emergency. Because to us, it's something that we want to keep sacred and holy, that we want to honor God by resting on that day. You know, I love, I'm going to close with this. It won't be on the screen, so you can just listen to it. But in, in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Jesus says this, and, and this verse the last couple years has really spoke to me, and this is the message translation of it. But Jesus is saying this. He says, are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you will recover your life. I will show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Doesn't that sound amazing? And maybe in your head you heard that and you thought, yeah, right, my life could never be like that. It's a process. It's a process to learn the unforced rhythms of grace. God is not trying to force you into anything. He's trying to help you live and walk in freedom. He's trying to help you to be able to live and be the best version of yourself, the person who he created you to be. He's going to show you how to do it. You don't have to figure out how to do it. He's going to show you how to do it. He's given us the model and the example in Scripture, and he also continues to walk with us still today. When we spend time with him as we rest, we learn to walk in grace, in freedom, and in the authority that he has given us. When we come to him in prayer, and he is our best friend, he's the first person that we run to, and he's the person who we genuinely want to hear from. Our lives really change because our lives become in complete alignment with who he is. And it really is the best way to live. This is the way. God, we thank you that you have shown us the way. You have shown us the way. We don't have to do the guesswork to figure out how we can live free and light. God, this morning, that just sounds amazing to me. To live free and light. Not because we're free from responsibility or we're free from, from doing the things that we need to do, but because we're free from the burdens of life. We're free from the burdens that life tries to place on us that are heavy. They are ill-fitting. They are not the things, God, that you meant for us to carry. God, this morning, as we close, would we just come to you as we are? Would we recognize that we don't have to know all the right things to say? We just have to have the right heart. God, you don't look for the person who has it all together. You look for the person who knows that you are holding them together. God, we thank you that you hold us perfectly, that you sustain us, that you give us the grace that we need, even in seasons where we are so burnt out, where it feels like rest is impossible, where it feels like the demands are never ending. God, would we be able to create pockets of rest with you? Would we make those intentional choices to strategically plan out when we can rest and how we can rest? Would we be strategic about when we're going to spend time with you? God, this morning, I just pray that you would speak to every person in this room in a unique way. That you would speak to them exactly the thing that they are needing to hear. And God, that we would just leave today feeling so refreshed and in awe of who you are, just in awe that the God of the universe wants to be our friend. How incredible. 
you want to give us assignments. God, you want to anoint us for new purposes. You want to sustain us and fill us with joy. God, would you fill us with joy this morning? May we just, in these few minutes as we sing, recognize, God, that you are our champion, that we do not have to conquer anything because you have already conquered everything. And so we can trust in you. We can place our hope in you. And we can come to you and be filled exactly with what we need. God, we love you this morning. Would you pour your grace and your strength out? God, for every mom in this room, God, this morning, would they just feel your rest? Would they feel your peace? Would they hear your voice saying, you are doing a great job? God, would we know that we don't have to be perfect? We just have to be willing. We have to be willing. God, help us to continue to keep going and to keep serving you, whatever it looks like. God, we love you and we trust you. Thank you for being our lifeline and our lifeboat. God, help us. In Jesus' name, amen.